Hello and welcome to our podcast. Uh, my name is Blue Shifting. You found this lovely piece of internet and hopefully we'll be able to have some very interesting conversation for you tonight, especially because um, on one hand I've got probably my closest Star Wars expert I've ever met and he probably is one of the biggest fans of Star Wars in the country. Well, thank you. My name is Steven. Um, first of all, you're very flattering. <laughs> That's so... true. Like you keep saying it's not true, but it's true. <laughs> it is probably true. So yeah. I've basically just been a fan of Star Wars my whole life and enjoy it. And I'm the kind of guy to go and read all the backstories on all the characters and all the scenes. So, you know, not perfect. I don't know everything, but I like to do my research. And yeah. That's yeah also, like uh, a few months ago, I found like the hardest Star Wars quiz I could. And I sent it to him. I'm like, I want to see how you do on this. And I took it. I took it. and I got like maybe half. And I'm like, I feel like I know Star Wars pretty good. I think, what, did you miss, like, one? And it was asking, like, about one of the actors, like, something that happened to an actor? Yeah, it was one of those. I hate actor questions because, to me, like, those don't belong in a Star Wars quiz because that's a movie-making trivia. I, yeah. I don't know, I'm kind of a purist that way, I guess. And that right. actually comes right to my uh, second guest, uh, my brother, who um, is a bit more of a movie critic. Um, he's obviously okay with Star Wars, but he's here more on the sense of helping us understand, uh, you know, scening, uh, plot, character development. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Landon. You can just call me that. I'm in, uh, you know, small town dude. Um, <laughs> trying to sound cool on a podcast. But I, I'd consider myself the average of the average, you know, but someone who really likes to think, like, just think about movies, see it more than once, and not so much tear it apart for tearing it apart's sake, but just kind of, you know, getting an idea for how the movie was made and appreciate the, you know, just the acting involved and, the stage direction, you know, that's all what I find interesting, but I could, you could consider me a control group, I'd say, you know, <laughs> to represent the exactly educated Star Wars person, but no, no, it's all good. And, and I think we're a good uh, collection here. Um, hopefully we'll be able to provide an interesting conversation. And by the way, if you are listening to this, I am going to give you the biggest of the biggest neon signs for a spoiler alert. We have no intention of, hiding or skirting around some of the details we want to talk about this in depth so if you have not seen the movie please 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 stop uh don't listen to this yet go f see the movie and then come back because uh, this is something that we want you to see in post uh hopefully we'll be able to kind of shed some light on the expanding universe that is now gone um what the potential is for this new movie and um just overall some some good invigorating questions. So I guess I want to start off first stuff by talking about going to the theater. So my wife and I went on Saturday and we went at like noon. I've been to theaters before, even for pretty big movies. And you go on noon and the place is sleeping and dead. There's just no one there. And like we walked into the theater, we, we get our tickets and we're walking back. And that's, that's kind of what I was seeing. It was like dead and like empty. And we we're like 20 minutes early. And we're like, okay, you know, this is going to be fine. Pretty good. Walked into the theater there were maybe five empty seats. Five. Everyone had been seated an hour and a half ahead on Saturday in this small little, like, uh, theater, kind of, like, way off in the side of Madison. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is incredible. Wow. And we were we were lucky to get able to sit next to each other, but we're in, like, the front row of the IMAX with 3D, so we're, like, back down there, like, necks, like, twisted, and just like, ah! <laughs> But, uh, I mean, it's funny because we've still got to see the movie. I will keep begging my wife that we're going to go see it again because I need to see it from the normal seating stands. <laughs> I feel like I was <laughs> missing stuff. Right. I know when we went, you know, this is a much smaller town than where you guys are, or well, where Jordan is, but it's more, <laughs> it's like, here it's more medium-sized, I guess. You can describe it. It's not super big, but it's not like an IMAX or anything, but it's not, you know, that one theater down on the corner with maybe two or three eating rooms, you know. Um, but me and my mom went, you know, uh, with her boyfriend because we had, there was no opening. And we actually arrived, I think, 20 minutes early for the um, 2D showing. Um, but the, we were told that it was 98% full on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, so we decided to wait the extra hour and a half for the 3D showing instead. Um, and well, boy, it was much better, I'd say. I, I really, they really been able to nail down that 3D building. But it's, other than that, we got pretty good seating and stuff. It was 
but I've never walked out of the theater feeling quite so, I don't know, satisfied, I guess, but I'll get to that later. So for me, going to the theater, um, I went and saw it the first time at the Thursday night pre-showing at 7.30. Um, I chose not to do the 3Ds because I'm not a, not a big fan of that, although I have heard it's good, so I'll have to go see it um, before it's out of theaters again. Please do. It, it is good. It's not that nauseating feeling but, anymore that it used oh, to be. Yeah, I've heard, and I had a friend who also went to IMAX 3D, and he said it was just amazing, so I'll have to go do that. But anyway, so I went to the theater. Um, I was afraid I'd be a little late to it just because of work, and I left work at about 4.30, got there about 5, and I was thinking it would already be too late to get in line, but no, like, we all were able to fit inside, and um, the line was not terribly long, but one thing that really impressed me about the line was that everyone was very very respectful of each other. Um, I, I went to the premiere of Revenge of the Sith back in 2005, and I remember going to the theater, everyone was just yelling and screaming. They were throwing stuff at each other. There was this random lightsaber fight out Jeez. in the parking lot. People just like were running together and banging each other. There's pieces of plastic flying everywhere. Someone even pulled out some eggs and started throwing them. Just like, oh my God. Yeah, I couldn't even believe <laughs> Riot. it. Wow. Well, they can and you do like the, yeah. the Tuscan War Raider cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was beautiful, Jordan. I need that as a ringtone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. and then in the theater for the movie, everyone was just yelling and screaming, and, you know, I can understand people getting excited for characters and everything, but it was a bit extreme, and honestly, I was expecting the exact same thing here, and so I was just dumbfounded with how nice and respectful everyone was, and even during the movie, uh, people would cheer when their characters came on the screen, but they were very nice about it, and it was kind of reserved, and and I really appreciated that. It was very different, so kudos to the fans here in Idaho, but um, interesting part of in being in line um, we were, we kind of were in this line that went up these stairs to the second floor and we went into the theater from the top. And one of the theater managers was getting our tickets at the top there. And he had some of the tickets get kind of stuck together at one point, kind of held up the line as he was trying to get them unstuck and all that. And so he was very nice about it. He said, sorry, guys, this is just kind of stuck together a little bit. And the people in the line were like, oh, take your time. You're fine. And so he kind of stopped and looked up. And he's like, you know, you guys are the nicest crowd I've ever had here. The Twilight fans are the troublemakers. <laughs> <laughs> all those right, team right. jacob and team edwards do yeah. that out in the parking lot it was just, it was just kind of funny but it was neat and you know the theater here we had quite a few members from the local 501st garrison and the rebel legion uh, for those who aren't familiar with those groups basically they dress up as star wars characters and they do charity and they're a worldwide organization um i'm a member of the rebel legion i have a generic jedi costume i'm working on a stormtrooper awesome. costume yeah well thank you <laughs> <laughs> i'm working on a stormtrooper costume to join the 501st but it was just kind of neat to to talk to those guys there and to see how nice these people are. And and then uh, the theater has a good relationship with them, too. And they even had a whole section of seats taped off at the back for the 501st members so they could stay in the lobby and meet the fans and then still make it to the movie as well. So it was just kind of neat, just very impressed with how respectful people were. Now, after the movie, when I came out, honestly, the first time, I wasn't sure what I thought about the movie, I'll admit. Because being such a huge Star Wars fan, I go in with a whole lot of expectations or hopes and then right. with the expanded universe being taken away that was a huge killer to me when i heard that the first time and yeah, and so no. just knowing what the storyline should have been at this point and so i really went in very nervous i guess but also excited and coming out i wasn't sure how i felt i thought i felt like i think i liked it i'm pretty sure i liked it but i had a lot to think about and then i saw it with our company <laughs> the very next being able to let things sit and so overall yeah i really do like the movie i really enjoyed it felt they did a great job so that was kind of my theater experience cool okay so i have to start us off here because this is one of my things what do you think about the costumes of the new stormtroopers because <laughs> it kind of looked like the derp army that could actually shoot stuff <laughs> you know i've seen a lot of people criticize the armor for being a they call them the duck troopers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> duck tails. <laughs> yeah, well, like they have the Disney figures that you can go get with um, Donald Duck in the Stormtrooper armor. And yeah, it fits his beak perfectly oh, or his bill or whatever they call it. But yeah, but honestly, you know, I like it. I do admit I wasn't sure how I felt about it the first time I saw the armor, especially after seeing it in action. Like that's another suit I'd like to get eventually. I think it's really neat. Um, one thing, one complaint I did have about the armor um, I don't know if you remember in Toy Story, there's a scene where Buzz Lightyear loses his arm. And so yeah. you yeah. have him holding his arm and you see like the little plastic stud that sticks into his arm socket, you know. And, and I felt like that construction of his arm is kind of what the new Stormtrooper's arms look like. 
honestly to me it looks like they have a round ball socket and then like the arm sticks in there and i don't know that's my only real complaint with their armor just that one part it looks like a toy arm socket but <laughs> yeah. other than that i like it okay you know i i don't know how i like when i went in there you know to be honest i didn't know exactly what to expect i hadn't heard any of a i and honestly was avoiding the internet all the way up until the point i saw the movie to avoid spoilers but I thought the suit looked nice. I did notice a few points where, like, the helmet seemed a bit bigger than it really should be. But, <laughs> you know, I, I was, I, you know, it just seemed a little cumbersome for those who would be wearing it. But I thought, you know what, it's probably either a limiting, you know, like, them making it for a prop, like, in the, for the actual movie stuff. Is it something they had to work around? Or maybe they, someone said, no, the suit needs to be bigger. They wouldn't be able to fit all that breathing stuff in there if they couldn't, you know, or something like that. <laughs> Either way, I thought it worked great, you know, but that's, I don't know the what changes they made. <laughs> yeah, and also about the Stormtroopers while we're on that subject, you know, a lot of people criticize the original trilogy saying Stormtroopers can't shoot anything, and, and I admit, <laughs> they're fun to make fun of, and it's kind of a fun and cultural thing, you know, but I'm of the group. Um, trying to let the Rebels escape to find where the base was and whatnot. I'm, I'm one of those people. But I did appreciate being able to see a movie with the stormtroopers in action where they were actually really in action and, and doing a good job. And so I don't oh, yeah. know. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. But did did you also notice that like not only were they in action, but like they made it a point to make them like clearly the bad guys. Like we're not even like ten minutes into the movie. It's like murder the villagers. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. These guys are literally the worst things in the galaxy right now. Yeah, okay. that was the sense I got from the First Order in general. It's like, they're not messing around. They're just, no. they're making a statement right. and they're doing it well. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the, the establishment, I have to say. If you're going to establish this, like, this omnipresent evil feeling, that was a good way to introduce it, that these are, like, mindless, like, robot automatist people who just do what they're told. And then you get that really cool contrast with Finn. Now, like, I think yeah. Finn's interesting because I can't figure something out. I want to know what your opinion is. Do you think he's a clone or is he a person? Because he's given like this weird serial number, but then he talks about being taken away from his family. I think at this point they've kind of ditched the, I don't know the like lore behind it, but um, to me it seems more the clone stuff died off way long ago. You know, like the that wouldn't really be that big of a thing. Like it's, like with breeding and stuff, you know, it probably the genetic lines would have been mixed anyway with other people. But at this point, I think you know they're not making clones anymore, uh, so it, I, I think it kind of makes sense. Just but you're raising someone from a child, kind of the same thing, you know. Okay, so kind of like Spartan and Halo type of deal. Yeah. Well, and actually, too, I was a little bit confused about that the first time I saw the movie, just because there's so much to process, you know, you're missing lines and details. The second time I saw it, though, there's the part where. Um, Captain Phasma is talking to, uh, I think it's General Hux. Um, they're talking about, or maybe she's talking to Kylo Ren. I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, she's talking to someone about Finn, basically, saying that he had a, a breach and went to her office and talked to him and everything. Um, but then she kind of poked fun at this other guy, just saying, like, if you're, um, would you prefer to, oh, right, no, maybe it's the other way. He was poking fun at Captain Phasma about, like, getting a clone army and instead of her trained troops so they're not clones apparently but they okay. kind of reference it again saying maybe the clones would be more effective i have to see it again to remember exactly who's in that scene that sounds about right but, i know there's some yeah, kind so, of dimensional clones though yeah and i would missed it the first time too just because there's so much going on but um yeah the clones you know they had double the growth rate and so it took them only 10 years to get to be in their 20s and you know it doesn't stop there though if you watch the rebel um the cartoon star wars rebel series animated series you have captain rex who is also in the clone Wars series but by the point of the rebel series he's old and gray and yeah. so by the time of this movie they would have all been dead right <laughs> oh, yeah that makes sense that is another question um did they were they actually allowed to like or were they able to reproduce with you know anyone else or did they like cut that out of the uh, genome that's a good question too like so i read this comic it was a comic about um kind of a a history of a story about Django and Boba Fett. Um, I think it's called Bloodlines. I could be wrong. It's, but essentially in the story, there is, it starts off with Django on a mission and he goes and he takes out basically a, a clone who had defected from the army. And he went and he basically 
killed him in, in front of his family. Um, and the son never forgot. And so this clone did have a son. And then later on in the story, Boba Fett meets up with the son and talk about Django and whatnot. But just from that story, I don't know if it's technically canon or not anymore. But if it is, then apparently the clones could reproduce. Okay. Yeah. I just it never really made that clear. But yeah, I so... need to. I guess uh, I guess one thing we should make clear though, just for our listeners, just in case you aren't aware, um, there is something called the expanded universe, which is like a collection of narrative stories, comics, and uh, books that have been made that were made about the after the movies, before the movies, and between the movies, during the movies, everything you can think about Star Wars. I think they have over ten thousand years of documented Star Wars quote history. <laughs> and it's an impressive collection, and some a lot of the stories and characters are fabulous. Um, but that's all been uh, chucked out and called uncanon. So effect- effectively, it's all just fan fiction, even though it all ties together super well. So now the only stuff that's canon is the prequels, um, the TV series, I think it was the Clone Wars, the, uh, the computer animated one. Uh, then we have uh, the, the Rebel series that's, coming, that's out right now, uh, the normal 456 that we all grew up with. And now these uh, new set of movies, plus the the Rogue One movie that's coming out next year, and a, a Han Solo and Boba Fett movie, if I'm correct. Actually, that's not. We don't know if that one's happening. It's a rumor. There's a Han Solo one for sure, yeah, but don't know about Boba Fett. I'm kind of personally hoping that they're going to do one for him, but don't know yet. I, I don't. Are they'd be successful. That he's Boba <laughs> Fett, probably one of the most popular characters of the series. Yeah. It's Especially kind of funny. Especially like five lines. <laughs> yeah, like I talked to. Um, I talked to one of the actors down at Comic-Con, um, uh, Jeremy Bullock, and we kind of asked him why, I guess you were there too, but um, we asked him why he's such a popular character, and he kind of said, you know, I don't really know, <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, everyone just loves him for some reason, and I'm one of those. But also regarding the canon, though, there are also a few books that are, there's all the books coming out now, I think, are official canon. Like, there's one about Grand Moff Tarkin that is, there's one about Darth Plagueis, that is, and there's a few others, so. Oh, man. Uh, so, guys, real quick, can you do a brief, brief summary, Stephen? If we were in the expanding universe 30 years after the, the the death of the Emperor, what would we be looking at as far as the expanding universe goes? Like, what part of the plot would we be in? Um, and I could have the time a little bit off on here, because I haven't gone to this part of the universe for a while, but I believe this would have been the time period where... Han and Leia had, and their son, Jason, um, became a, a Sith Lord named Darth Cadus. And I believe that's that would have been the time period. So it's interesting that Kylo Ren is kind of filling that role. Oh. Um, it's also interesting, though, that at that time <laughs> period, Luke um, had married Mara Jade, who was known as the Emperor's Hand. Uh-huh. And they had had a son, and they named their son Ben. Yeah, and Han exactly. and Leia had the twins. Yeah, oh and Han and Leia had the twins, Jason and Jaina, and then their third son was Anakin. So it's interesting oh. to me that they chose Kylo Ren's name as Ben, but it's Han and Leia's son instead. So it's interesting that they might be kind of giving a nod to the expanded universe, although they're definitely going away from it. Oh, um, absolutely. Also, at this point, you would have, yeah, you would have already had the use on Vong War as well, but you know, I'll be honest, I wasn't. <laughs> That's a part of the storyline we, anyway, so we don't need. Hard. That that could die, and we're okay with that. <laughs> I have to say, yes, so, name of uh, Kylo Ren, his real name being, it's probably Ben Solo, right? Like, do you think he yeah, took the Solo, ben Solo name? I have to say, touchdown for the writers. Uh, obviously, maybe they don't know the Expanding Universe super well, but when uh, that was a cool reveal for like Star Wars fans, when, when Solo gets onto the bridge with him and just yells, Ben! That was actually, I thought... As far as our art direction and acting uh, goes, I felt like that was one of like the premier moments of the movie, because uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, Harrison Ford he's still a great actor, and he just had so much emotion in that it felt like real. Like, and I remember in the theater, everyone went dead quiet when that happened. Like, because you <laughs> normally hear like the little shuffling sounds, maybe a little whispering, but like when he when he yelled Ben, it suddenly was. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was gone and it's like and the worst part though is that that scene like it's like leading up to this whole the big twist you know where um mm-hmm. where where han dies and i remember thinking though i was he's standing on the end of the bridge he says ben he's like you gotta you can come back 
you know, I have hope for you. And, and it turns around, and I start hearing the dialogue, and I see the way that they're lined up, and immediately I knew exactly what was going to happen. I was almost disappointed because, like, that's a huge twist, and I'm like, it's incredible. And I honestly feel like it fits. It's really sad, right. but that's part of what makes this series so memorable is, like, when the beloved character dies, it leaves a big impact. But mm -hmm. the lead up to it was almost perfect, but then right as it was coming to fruition, I suddenly knew exactly what was going to happen. And I knew almost exactly how it was going to happen. I, I wish they could have executed that a little better to where it would have felt more sudden when he died. Because how sh how much would it be if I had like literally not even thought about the po the possibility of Han being killed until he was dead? Yeah. Well, and, you know, that part for me also, first of all, yelling out the name Ben, you know, I thought it's neat they chose that as his name, but at the same time, it would have made more sense to keep that to Luke's offspring, just because Leia and Han didn't really know Obi-Wan at the time he went by the name Ben, but... I hey, kinda... hey, I, I, I gotta interject here. Uh -huh. Nobody really knew Ben. I mean, right. Luke <laughs> possibly knew Ben? We think about it, like, he was, like, just some old crazy man who lived in the mountains who happened to come down, hand him a lightsaber, take him onto a starship... They, he turns off the tractor beam and gets killed. And why is he like this pinnacle person well, in Luke's life even? like You do have to think. <laughs> it was like uh, when, there were, I mean, Luke didn't know him very well, but he obviously knew the guy by name. If it was given a vague description, Obi-Wan Kenobi, what, you mean old Ben? You know, in that, uh, in the first one, it's just more, I think that they had like a bit of a history. Like he wasn't so much the crazy old cute on the hill who knows how to talk to sand people or whatever, <laughs> or how to scare them away. But more, he was the guy you'd you'd go and borrow sugar from on a, you know, <laughs> warm some summer day or whatever. Yeah, I love that bantha sugar, you know. Right? Oh yeah. So <laughs> so effectively though, what we're describing here is, um, if the situation were me, it's like me and my wife, we have a son. And we're like, huh, we need to have a good name for him. Let's not name him after our grandfather. Let's not name him after, like, a best friend, like Lando. I don't know. That would have been a good name. No, no, no. Let's name him after my best friend, my brother-in-law's old kooky neighbor who I talked to four times. Yeah. And, you know, I can <laughs> kind of understand it just from, like, and maybe... My brother thinks maybe Luke had to say, like, oh, let's name him Ben. Although, I mean, what family does that? You know, ask the uncle. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to name him here. You name him. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm fine with it because, I mean, it's, it is it is kind of a, um, I don't know, a nice emotional connection back to the past. True. And, like, like I can see, like, that's what makes you think it I is just, a shout-out. It would have made more sense to be Obi-Wan. Yeah. I'm happy with it. That's true. Ben's a good name anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> But then you know leading up to that scene my coworker pointed out something i missed the first time i saw it but the lighting in that scene when kylo ren is talking to han yeah. and they're up face to face um half of kylo ren is lit up blue and the other half is lit up red right up until the point before he kills han and then apparently it goes all red yeah and that's it's cool. the i didn't yeah. notice that that's awesome and i didn't the first time either and i thought that was that was very creative you know i was focused on a lot of other stuff but very cool when I was, uh, during that moment, it was actually one of the best parts of the movie for me. And I mean, not like, oh, yes, Han's dead, but more like, <laughs> oh, man, they really did that well, you know? Um, yeah. But it, the thing is, is that I rarely feel, for one, like real emotion when I'm at a movie. So not that movies don't do it for me. It's just like, it's kind of, you know, it's a movie. It's it's it just kind of like, you you know, you're sitting in a chair. But this one, when, you know, they had all, I think they had all the shots in the right places. But when they got to that point, I mean, like, you could see them, like, struggling over the lightsaber for that brief shot. And then when the, the lighting changed, when the sun disappeared in the background, you could tell what was going to happen. But for me, the whole time I was sitting there thinking, I, actually, I wasn't thinking. My brain was just, like, off, you know, like, totally <laughs> immersed at that point. I wasn't thinking, like, when is he going to die or not? It was just more like silence for the whole minute dur duration. I, I don't even know how long it was because I was so just engrossed. And it was... It wasn't surprising, I'd say, it, but it was, well, I mean, I kind of, you could guess, it could go either way when you're sitting at the theater, but for me, it was more, when it happened, I was just silent, you know, it's just one of those things, you have to, have to sink in, I don't know. They, did that I, really I just happen? Really that well. <laughs> they, yeah, they I don't know. I think it's, I thought it was really well done, though, on their part, especially that lighting.
thing though. Like you notice, I'm, I I did notice just things where it it just you get that rise of emotion, you know, and like all of a sudden he's red and they're fighting over the thing. Yeah, that's crazy. yeah. Well, and before the movie, my brother and I were talking about what we thought was going to happen, and thought if any of the main characters die, it's most likely going to be Han. And so we were kind of expecting it, but at the same time, you don't want to see it happen because it's Han Solo, the character you grew up with, you know. And then right. the second time I saw the movie, it was just it was just as bad. Even though I knew what was going to happen, it was just as bad the second time. Just thinking, no, I see this part, I know what's coming. So yeah, I mean, part of me wishes Han went out in like a a flaming ball of fire up in space somewhere. But I don't know. I think that this was a good way to send him out as well from a family member because it keeps it very personal. Oh, man. Oh, you keep reminding me of so much stuff, but I know. Like, I think let, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. And like, I want to start talking about the movie as a whole. Um, but very specifically, I want to say the one of the only things, the biggest problem with the plot, I have to say, is it's not just making like references to the first Star Wars, A New Hope. It's like blatantly copying it in some space, in some respects. I mean, mm-hmm. if you think about it, we have an intro of um, you know you got the combat. It's kind of cool. Finn's a little bit of a unique case, um, but there's conflict on sword. Like, well, not Imperial, but the remnants of the Imperial Star Destroyer, and then you have a droid that is sent with important plans that must be re- re- given to the rebellion, <laughs> off into the desert where he doesn't know anything going on. It happens to me, a desert dweller who just happens to be like the apparent chosen one who can wield the force, <laughs> who then has to escape off of the planet on the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> and then um, they, and then, and then in the course of the movie, then there's a giant super weapon that does something horrible to an innocent planet that never knew. And then before it can fire again, they have to go and destroy it. And, there's a trench the process, run. and while they're like on the, on the giant, like super weapon, uh, the, the mentor character, gets killed by the Sith character, establishing the hatred between like the main Jedi character and the Sith character. And uh, then afterwards, uh, kind of touches base a bit more into Return- uh, Empire Strikes Back, where the main character is instructed uh, to seek out the wise old sage to receive proper training. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like the same over our plot. Like, and also, you also, um, Ray, which by the way, my favorite character possibly of the whole series she's fantastic but she also is one of those like she jumps in a spaceship i can fly like a master (laughs) i don't know maybe that's just the force thing coming through but i feel like that in itself is kind of a cop-out but yeah like does the force have knowledge of uh how ships run (laughs) maybe the millennium falcon maybe that i mean because i (laughs) I know the force enhances someone's mind and it kind of helps control their abilities. The thing is knowing exactly how mechanics work, you know, like you'd have to have at least a, a background, but kind of an interesting note on that though, I was looking through the visual, um, I guess it was the incredible cross sections book for this movie. And I had a little blurb in there on Ray's speeder, which my brother called the Magnum bar speeder. Which I thought <laughs> was really funny. Um, uh, apparently that particular speeder though is, overpowered for its size and it can actually fly to about the same height as an airspeeder and so it mentioned that ray likes to practice flying on that thing just because it's basically like an airspeeder so you're saying that she can fly a passenger jet because she knew how to ride a jet ski in the air yeah well, basically <laughs> you know I'd, I'd argue in this in this fact that it's it's not so much well, i don't know much about the force you know i'm not a jedi but or it's the sports for that matter. Um, but it's, I could see it being more, the, it's, the force isn't like whispering to her subconscious or whatever, pull that lever to your left and push this button and pull it into a spiral. It's probably more like, it, it kind of, <laughs> I would say it more expands her knowledge of, uh, not like just knowledge, but I mean her understanding or um, situational awareness without her actually knowing about it. Since she, mm-hmm probably doesn't have any training she doesn't even know what she can do where it's more it brings in her inner instincts not saying that her instincts know how to fly the millennium falcon either but more she has experience around that um, broken down ship you know all the time in mm-hmm. object who but more that she just kind of has a feel like for flying things in general but then the the force that she doesn't even know she has yet kind of 
gives her that little bit of instinct that she didn't have before, allowing her to kind of make guesses that turn out to be right. But that that would be my best guess. My... That's how I feel about it. You know, like it yeah. doesn't it doesn't control what she does, doesn't tell her exactly, but it, it enhances the knowledge that she already must have. And I think a lot of that will be answered as we find out more about her past. She was apparently abandoned on abandoned on Jakku at about age four. And so we don't know much about what she was learning before then. We don't even know what she was doing for a lot of her life on the planet yet. No, that's still a little story starting to come out about that. But I think that will be answered, you know, and some of the questions I also had about it was how does she know how to speak Wookiee and she understands the BB-8 and then she knows how to fly everything. I think there's a substantial part of her past that we just don't know yet. And a lot of that could be what happened before her family abandoned her. Maybe she knew that from beforehand and just has kept with it all those years. She also could just be a Time Lord. <laughs> Gosh, that'd be the weirdest crossover ever. <laughs> Maybe she has a time turner in there, so she can oh, go to Wookiee geez. class and droid class. Oh no! Oh gosh, that's awesome though. Okay, but here's yeah. another thing. So another criticism I have against the movie. I mean, this might be coming from the physicist part of me, but apparently when they built the hunk of junk that is the Millennium Falcon, they built it out of like <laughs> strong titanium mixed with like titanium mixed with adamantium mixed with apparently like an unbreakable <laughs> fragment of the universe because how many times when they're flying her they're just like literally like smash smash crash into the sand crash into snow i don't care if it <laughs> looks like it's soft it's not soft that shit should not have been flying yeah oh i remember that was a great part first time watching the theater when the falcon was just scraping along the ground everyone in the crowd just started groaning like oh no no <laughs> <laughs> it was comical I, I appreciate the comical value and the like the the tension added to the scene but there was a part of me that was screaming well now it should be not flying anymore right or at least severely beat up yeah i agree with that you know part of me wanted to say like well maybe deflector shields and whatnot but deflector shields don't work like that you know it's like han <laughs> says to finn later on that's not how the force works <laughs> but they even that's make a point for her work. later on when they're being chased like han's like where's the shields yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, that's in movies the way I see it with that kind Finn, of stuff happening. So. It's just it's just more not comic relief, but just kind of an and builds to the scene. You don't have to pay attention for like for us who notice that and are like, all right, well, there better at least be a broken landing gear or something, you know, even though there wasn't. <laughs> I mean, you just kind of say, eh, it's, it's as if it never happened. We'll just imagine that they kind of had a little rough landing when they. Yeah, yeah. That was, that's a problem for me watching movies, especially Star Wars, because I'm such a purist and an idealist when it comes to these things. And and you guys know that, like you a commentary playing the old Republic and, you know, I comment on every little style choice they make. But that's my problem with watching these movies. Steven, is, Steven, Steven. You know, some of the things are just simply. <laughs> Steven, yeah. other people, other people comment. No, no, I, no one reads the signs in the language, the lettering of Star Wars and tells me what they're saying. <laughs> That's you awesome. do that. <laughs> yeah, it's just for me, though, like, I sometimes have to remind myself, this is a movie and this is just a simple technique of movie making. And that's it. You know, a lot of people like I, I had a conversation on Facebook with some people the other day about what lightsaber colors mean. And they were getting into like, oh, you have a certain color based on what class of Jedi you are. Or you have a different color based on the type of uh, combat you use. Or you have a certain color based on your personality. And, you know, simple answer to that. And all the research I've done is. I mean, video games tend to say there's the whole class thing with the different colors, but ultimately you go to Wikipedia, which to me is the number one source of the most up-to-date information, and there is nothing in there about color. It's just simply, that's just the colors they use. I mean, there's a little bit like the Sith tend to use red because it synthesized crystals and whatnot, but, you know, things like that. We like to look into them in a lot of detail as fans, like the Millennium Falcon scraping along the sand, but, you know, we just have to kind of remind ourselves, like, you know, it's just a movie-making thing, and they're mm -hmm. not intending it to be completely... Detailed, you know, but it's hard. And I know it's hard for me. <laughs> well, like, I like to have an explanation for everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one thing a lot of people, you know, they want that kind of satisfaction. You know, but why they they put it in here for a reason? There obviously much must be more behind it, some kind of lore. You know, like there's a lot of explanation for the lightsabers that I don't know. But like that's an example. I, I the way I describe it to somebody else, you know, and my is like. How come this guy's is red and that guy's is blue? What if I like the color blue and I'm a Sith Lord? You know, it's more. I'd say it's more of a theatrical thing, you know, it's like you said, it's strictly for the movies. I have, lightsabers are a different story, but for an example, it's something to consider at least. It is, you know, like Yoda has a green lightsaber, you know, people 
might not have considered, well, maybe that's because he's green, you know, or something like that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's more, I'd say it's, it's like blue and red. Red's always been kind of a sinister color and there's, they've actually done, you know, tests and I've proven that people respond differently to things that are marked red versus blue. Like blue is more of the kind of controlled, you know, you think about things kind of cooler color while red seems to be more of the like the color for anger that, you know, something that's fast, sharp, dangerous, you know, stuff like that. I, I think at first that's probably the whole yeah. reason why they chose it in the first place, but then people go through and choose, make their own reasons. And ones that make sense, you know, like crystals and stuff. I, I don't know anything about those, but I believe those, but I, I think at first people, if, and a reasonable explanation for at least one that I've accepted is that, you know, that's probably just the way that they thought it would like, you know, I, if I were to be a, was it a figure for good, you know, a Jedi, someone who's supposed to represent and protect all that is good, you know, I'd choose a color that would probably, people would probably respond best to in my weapon, you know, where if you're right. fueled by your anger and you want to cause destruction, you know, red pretty menacing when you think about it. <laughs> it's yes, kind true. of a, a whole, there's a whole thing to it, the whole scientific side, I, I'm like I'm no doctorate, so I wouldn't know that. I yeah. Don't. So, you know, it just comes down to movies sometimes. They just, filmmakers make decisions like that for whatever reason. We can't look into it too much. And, you know, this movie for me, as much as I liked it, it had a lot of moments like that for me. In right. style choices where it's just like, you know, it's just a movie and it's not meant to be looked into too much. You know, I kind of, I remember a comment that Stan Lee made at Comic-Con. Someone asked him who would win between, um, like, a Marvel superhero and a DC superhero. I think they actually used Batman and Superman. Or, uh, no, it would. I think it was the, the Avengers and Justice League. I don't know. I wasn't there. I just read it. But anyway, Stan Lee's response was my favorite. He said, depends on who's writing the story. Right, yeah. True. And I, I love that response from him, because he's, like, Mr. Marvel, you know? Like, he's the Marvel guy. But he even he admitted that it doesn't really matter. Just whoever wants to write a story however they want. And so this movie yeah. did have a lot of those moments for me. As much as I liked it, though, I just have to remind myself. Don't nitpick it too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. Okay, but here's a cool one. What about the new look and sound of the lightsabers? I have to oh, admit, man. I first heard it, I was just like, oh, it kind of sounds gross. But then, like, as it went <laughs> on, I was just like, that actually is really cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know. You know, the way I see it is, like, you know, from the little boy inside me, like, oh, man, that sounds so cool and dangerous, you know. But then, like, I think about it logically when you think about it before they used what they could which you know the lightsaber noise is like zhoo, zhoo, zhoo. well the way they came up with the sound was a complete accident anyway it's kind of a funny story well how did they do that actually um so like the story. sound designer yeah the sound designer ben burt um he actually shows up in a cameo in a couple of the movies too which is kind of cool but the sound designer he was kind of struggling to come up with the sound for the lightsaber he wasn't sure exactly what to do for it he kept trying different things just wasn't completely satisfied and then on accident, he happened to walk past the CRT monitor um, with a microphone, and the monitor was turned on, and oh. it made a funny sound when he walked past. And so that's how they got the original sound. And I've actually oh. heard that sound. I had an electronics class, and my electronics teacher did the same thing. He turned on a computer monitor and took a microphone over, and it sound, it's exactly a lightsaber. And you know, that's kind of how they got it. It may not have been a CRT monitor originally, but it was something like that, either that or something similar. But yeah, it's kind of funny, kind of funny story how they got that. Well, awesome. anyway, that's awesome. But uh, just think about it, though. Like, that's how they got those sounds. And it sounds like a lightsaber. You know, well, it's, it is the lightsaber, but it kind of sounds like a big beam of light that would make noise and cut people in half and burn them while they do it. You know, that, that's kind of, you know, it kind of gives off that feel. <laughs> well, it also gave me the impression, though, of, like, if you had a bunch of bees trapped inside a maraca. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good, uh, very good description. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the thing, though. Like, the new ones, though, like, you think about the old ones, it, it seems, like, more controlled, like, something that's... It's, it just sounds like a buzzing stick, you know? That happens to flow. <laughs> but now... The fear of the buzzing <laughs> stick! Yeah! <laughs> I mean, like, think about it though. In this, the way now that everything's modernized, which I'll admit, some of the, there's a lot of this movie suffered from the modernization of action movie, but I think they really were able to integrate it well enough. Um, but that's besides the point. See, like, I, I would think if I were to hold a stick that could extend a beam of p pretty much pure energy, you know, I think it'd be pretty violent, you know. Some, however, they were managed to make it so controlled in that focused beam it probably wouldn't make very pretty sounds, you know, especially that red one. If you ever look <laughs> close enough, when they, like, do that clash uh, between Ray and, uh, oh, I forget the bad guy's name. I, honestly, I've only seen it once. Yeah, him. <laughs> <laughs> it's my position. Anyway, 
when they first clash, you know, you see they're pushing on each other with their lightsabers. You can see his is more eccentric, it's like buzzing around, like he kind of got more of a lightning right. metal tube kind of vibe to it. It, it looks great, while well, hers is more, you know, Luke's saber is more, uh, it's stable. It looks like it's well made. You know, his seems more yeah. ragtag. I really, and I really like that contrast, but then it, it also it makes the other one more menacing, though, because it seems more unpredictable, more violent, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty sweet. And I, I really like the lightsabers. Like Kylo Ren's, first of all, the reason it's kind of unstable is because the crystal he's using, it's a, called a kyber crystal, and his is actually cracked uh, because it, his handle is, his hilt is overpowered, and the crystal can't quite handle the power. And so, actually, the reason the cross guards are there, you look at the saber close up and at the cross section score, and it mentions how the cross guards are there because they're kind of a, an outlet, like a heat like outlet, vent. like a, yeah, kind of a vent just to let some of the energy out, and it just happens to work as a, um, and so that's why his is very unstable. And also, if you look at the handle close up, it looks very much handmade. Like there's a an exposed wire on the outside. It looks just it looks like a piece of trash basically. But um, <laughs> and apparently he built it himself, which you know good for him. But it's it's kind of struggling. And so I thought it was great from an archetypal point of view. Just like he is the archetype of this, and, and he has this saber that really matches that very well. Um, and then I remember though, the first time Ben turns on Luke's lightsaber and just the sound that came from that thing, like they have beefed up the bass on that substantially <laughs> from the previous series. And I just loved it. Turning that on just thinking, oh yeah, now that is a weapon. Like Kylo Ren, yeah. it's cool. It's kind of a put together homemade toy, but that blue lightsaber, that is a weapon. That is a fine piece of art right there. And I just loved how they did that. Um, I just had this... a flash. I said a flash. What would it be like if you were a typical soldier in Star Wars? So say you're a stormtrooper in that around that time. So you're like running around, and you're like pew pew pew, ha ha, die peasants, you know, doing this <laughs> thing, and like, oh, I'm doing so good. My training's coming through. There's something behind you. Bleh! You're like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I love though, I loved how this movie did what so many should have done. Where so we have Finn, stormtrooper not force sensitive at all and in the middle of combat he's holding his lightsaber and he's just like okay turn it on and it makes sense because i mean there's the argument that's always been made is like if you don't have the force you're liable to hurt yourself with a lightsaber than you will than somebody else honestly that is kind of bull because i mean you think about it, medieval ages they had swords i mean yes they couldn't cut through steel but it's not like people are out there swinging them around and cutting themselves in half i mean like, if you have right. a handle and you well, have a blade, thing... you know not to touch yourself. I feel like you could do basic combat maneuvers. And so if you're fighting, like, normal troops, I feel like you could still be pretty effective. Right. Well, one thing about that, too, um, you think about a lightsaber, and how much do you think a blade weighs? Probably, like, nothing. If it's made of, if it's actually made of light, then it wouldn't really mm -hmm. have a weight that you could detect. Yeah. Exactly. It's... And can you imagine how disorienting that would be? Like, imagine yeah, Darth be... Maul with the staffs spinning that thing around, but there's no weight other than the handle. And that's okay, why well, it's so yeah. dangerous. Double-ended blades, you probably would kill yourself. <laughs> I'm talking about the standard normal sword. Right. And, like, here's the, I guess here's the other problem you'd have with it, though, is, like, it'd be like taking a sword to a gunfight. Where if he had a troop of soldiers, you know, like in defenses, aiming down their sights at him with their guns, and he can't block their shots, he's pretty much done. But for the close quarters combat that was involved in right. the situation, it was a very effective tool. And it's the first time we've seen somebody who isn't a force user pick up a lightsaber and use it as a weapon. And I thought that was refreshing. I thought it was a nice little thing. And it also brought a cool contrast when he first challenges Kylo Ren and just gets absolutely destroyed. And then you kind of get to see the contrast of a force user well, wielding a lightsaber against him, and then you see Ray just kick his butt. You know, right. I always thought, imagine how it would feel though, because it's, it's the lightsaber. You, you got to think there's a lot of probably a lot of tech packed into that that hilt there. But then pulling it around, you know, it just it just makes noise, and you're like, eh, this. but when you push against somebody though, that must feel pretty weird because you're only holding the weight of the handle. And you both are, but you're pushing against the force mm -hmm. that. They just, they just, that I don't think I'd be able to hand cut my own. I'd, I'd probably turn the thing on upside down, you know. <laughs> Actually, that they, they been, they would, I don't think they should have put it. <laughs> I don't think they should have put it in the movie, but it would have been funny to think about, you know, he's standing there, he's got both hands on the, the saber, you know, when he first turns it on. But, like, imagine he presses the button and it goes straight down, and he's like, oh, crap, you know, and it flips it around and, and goes after him. <laughs> 
<laughs> have you ever so remember when you're like kids have you ever seen like little kids who are like are holding like old plastic swords or something and like you hit it and it just goes back and smacks them right in the forehead <laughs> how many yeah. i wonder how many times through the star wars history like some trainee who's like never had a lightsaber in their hands like playing with it when they shouldn't be has had somebody come up and like hit it and it's gonna go and just crumple <laughs> to the ground i guess we'll never know because they're not around to tell about it <laughs> Well, yeah. you think somebody would have written it down, or, or maybe that's the deep dark secret in the bottom of the Jedi archives. <laughs> <laughs> well, and another one of the reasons, though, why lightsabers are so dangerous to non Force users, kind of going back to the weight thing, I guess. Um, you know, think about if you're just carrying like a, a foot long stick you found on the ground when you're camping or whatever, and then like something happens and you fumble and you drop it. What does that stick do on its way down? It spins head over tails several times through the air before it hits the ground. But if you have some <laughs> weight, like you know, you drop a sword that way, the weight of the blade prevents it from doing that. True. And so that's one of the main dangers of it, just not having that sense of weight there. And we do know from episode three, General Grievous is not a Force user, and he was handling four of them. You know, granted, he's a little, he's enhanced <laughs> with his droid parts and whatnot, but I, I really like that part too, though, with Finn using it, because a lot of, I've heard a lot of criticism about that, like how Rey and Finn were able to kind of sort of hold their own against Kylo Ren. But honestly, I had no problems with it, because there's many, there's several reasons for it. First of all, uh, Finn is a stormtrooper. He is trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, not just a blaster. Yeah. Um, obviously he wasn't super great at it i mean he got his butt kicked even by the stormtrooper but you know at least he he could do it a little bit and that that made sense and in, in ray's case she's obviously very uh skilled with the quarter staff that she uses um and it's interesting to watch her style of fighting she does a lot of jabs almost as if it, yeah, she's trying yeah. to stab at the guy you know and so it kind of shows that she doesn't know what she's doing either but she's doing her best and then the other part of that, Kylo Ren was severely wounded by Chewie's blaster. But I must make a, another little side comment on the blaster here. First of all, that blaster, that crossbow that Chewie has in the movie, we see in a couple other scenes how explosive it is and it launches people backwards. You know, and Kylo Ren took yeah. it to the hip and didn't even flinch, really. I mean, he should have been sent way off that platform. That's just a you know minor little detail <laughs> there, but <laughs> pretty awesome crossbow. But anyway, he was severely wounded in fighting them. And so even if he was superiorly trained um, with the lightsaber, he couldn't exactly go full bore on him just because he was seriously hurt and wounded. Um, but oh, yeah. also, I think it showed that Kylo Ren is really strong and just raw force abilities. I mean, I don't know about you, but I about died when he stopped that blaster in the air. That oh, yeah. The beginning. That was I was thinking, oh, my goodness. Awesome. I thought yeah, I was like, and... how is that possible? <laughs> right. And so it shows that he is he's super strong in the force. You see him throwing people around, using the force that way, like... You know, Ray pulls out a blaster on him. He just forces her arm down there. He takes people's memories out of their brains. He is not someone to be messed with force. But you think about him with a lightsaber. Now, we don't know the history of him training with Luke and the Knights of Ren and whatnot, but I kind of tend to believe he doesn't really have a lot of people to practice the lightsaber with. And so it makes sense to me that even though he's maybe a little better than them, yeah, he just he's not practiced. He's strong in the force, but there's not, you know, cookie-cutter Jedi being produced in a factory that dime a dozen like there were back in the olden days and so it'd be kind of hard for him to find people to practice on and and so that's kind of my thoughts on it. i thought they did a great job at showing that they weren't that great at lightsaber fighting now it was good yeah. i really liked it all I, you know i like the fights and i like the fights in the prequel series but they're basically really fancy dances with swords and they're not really actually going for each other you know but they look cool and it's fine but i appreciated the duel in this movie because it was a little bit more similar to episodes five and they weren't there to be pretty. They were there to kill somebody. And yeah. I thought they did a great job at portraying that. I agree. I also think it's interesting, though, Kylo Ren um, character arc. I have to say, um, as far as characterization goes, I want to talk a little bit more about this, too. But Finn, Rey, and Kylo Ren have fantastic character arcs. I feel like that they yeah. have been written very, like, incredibly well. Not and to Kylo mention Ren's... the actors portraying them are doing a fabulous oh, job yeah. for being... Oh. And yeah. I looked at IMDb. This is like one of their pretty much their first big movie. Like they've right. done a couple of things here or there, but this is their first like massive title, and they are just killing it. Uh huh. But um, Kylo Ren's story, um, I thought it was really interesting because it was a perspective you never really think about. Where he's like sitting in meditation and he's like whispering to himself, and he talks about how like the light is is uh, rising again, and like I have to I have to fight this temptation. I've never heard of the light side of the force being like referred to as a temptation, as a burden to be rid of. It's like, that's and interesting. And wasn't that an interesting spin on it? You always think of the dark side, but yeah, very interesting. I want to see where they take that. Like, I want to, I, I, if they do this right, I'm wondering if we're going to get to the point where as we're watching Kylo Ren, we're going to start like following for and understanding his story and caring for him. You know, kind of like Snape. 
You know, when yeah. you start understanding him, you're like, oh, he's awesome. Like Kylo Ren, <laughs> I want to. I think I hope we get to have that same feeling, and almost like almost like want to take his side by the end of it. Like that yeah. would be fantastic. Right. You know, and I have some, and I wasn't going to bring this up yet, but I think this is a good time to to bring this part up. But I've been thinking a lot about Kylo Ren's character and. Most of my, I have this, you know, Google Doc I wrote down a lot of comments on after I saw the movie, and most of them are regarding him just because to me he's a very fascinating character. Like, I love all the others, they're great, but mainly him just because we don't know a whole lot, and it, it brings in a lot of interesting tensions and emotions to the movie. But, you know, personally, I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of this new trilogy, he ends up turning back to the light and helping try to defeat Snoke and then gets killed in the process or something, maybe. But, That'd be sad. Um, and, you know, I because you kind of, I just think he's going to be good again, unless they do a good job of forcing him to keep it down and whatnot. But, um, down boy. Yeah, yeah. The water bottle. So I was reading, I, you know, I do a lot of looking around at people's comments on the movie on Facebook, just cause I like to get a feel for what the general populace thinks of the movie as a whole. And I came across this article that was basically this father and his kids went to the movie. And when they came out, this father in the car, apparently, just thought like, oh my goodness, I know what's going to happen. And he came up with this fan theory, basically, that I don't know that I completely agree with it, but it's very interesting. And I could see there being some potential there. But basically, this father thinks that Kylo Ren is kind of like Snape and that he's a, a sleeper agent, I guess you could say, where he is actually fighting for the good, but he has to go to the bad in order to do it. Um, hmm. And the reason he brought this up was saying, like, you know, the light was a temptation. He wants to be as strong as Vader. But he would have known at least we think he would have known that Vader in the end overcame the dark side. And so what if him saying he wishes he was strong enough, as strong as Vader is hoping that when he's done with his secret task, that he'll be able to get rid of the dark side and become good again. You know, and what if he knows that Snoke is this crazy powerful being and the only way to defeat him is to basically lie to him, become his apprentice, build up the strength in the dark side and then defeat him that way. You know, and I thought it was an interesting, an interesting take on it. And I could see I some was. potential there. Now, personally, I don't think that's what they're going to do, but it, but it, I don't know. It's an interesting take on the potential of the story. And there is a contrast too. Like, um, I do think that's interesting. What I was, if I were to predict, I kind of see it, would see it, you know, he, grew, he had like a troubled childhood or whatever, whatever, you know, happened to him that made him decide to betray Luke and stuff. You could see, you know, so it probably would be believing that the, the rebels, the ones who killed the Emperor and uh, Darth Vader, you know, how he could turn to that side. We used to call it the dark side, the bad guys, you know, but really in that position, I imagine everyone's kind of justified themselves, you know. They're lying to us, you know. The Empire was really was a, a good idea, you know, and they they ruined it for everyone, and now everyone's being lied to by this new, this new ruler, you know. And I could see that also he could just see it as I want to be as great as you grandfather, you know, but he'd never believe that Luke actually killed him or something like that. You know, I, I could, or that maybe he, like, I, I could see him totally believing, you know, like being a bad guy, but you know, he, he knows that part of him knows that it's what he's doing is wrong, but he's just, he can't believe he's, he's taught, taught himself or forced himself to believe that the, no, the resistance, they're, they're the bad guys. They're wrong. They're the ones who are lying to everyone and trying to play us into whatever their plans are, you know. And that they threw all these lies saying that my grandfather was a tyrant and a horrible person when really he was just doing stuff. You know, like, I could yeah. imagine him having that side, but of course we don't know enough yet. So that's, I'm really looking forward to the next yeah. few movies and stuff. To well, in one hole in the... And one hole in the father's theory about that, too, one of the reasons I don't think it's what they're going to be doing, um, as much as it's fun to think about, was he mentioned the whole scene with Kylo killing his father, you know, killing Han, and saying how maybe that's why he was asking for help, because he needed to get over that step to become the Lord. And I don't know, I don't know of anything in the dark side that has a requirement that you must kill your father to be a Sith Lord, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> but kind of interesting th part to think about. But yeah, I tend to agree with that, where just like, I think he's just a crazy fanboy for his grandfather. Um, you know, he's a little bit of an immature teenager kind of a personality, but you can tell he's trying. He's just, he's struggling with it because he's insecure. He knows what he's doing could be wrong, but he also thinks it's right. And he's very, um, adamant about it. Very passionate about it. True. Though, um, I think it's odd that like, for one thing, it, it seems odd that you could convince yourself that a super powerful weapon, the plasma planet would be a good thing. But, um, <laughs> I mean, we all have oversights. I mean, 
know, I, I don't like eating too much upset. chocolate. He likes blowing up planets. I mean, we've all got our vices. <laughs> but uh, one thing I've, I, I have a big issue with the giant super death ray weapon thing. Yeah, let's talk a, about that because I do too. <laughs> it feels like it was like I don't know. It's that whole like, oh, yours is big, one, well, mine is bigger kind of attitude. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, oh, we have the Death Star. How do we top that? How about we make a giant planet cannon? that eats stars and fires laser beams. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> it kind of sounds like something that was written by a 12-year-old, um, but they made it happen. And I, I can understand that you want to have the threat. And I have to admit, the scene where it shot the planet was really, like, visually cool. But, I mean, think about this. Why did we care? That planet literally wasn't named until it had been blown up. It mm-hmm. was vaguely alluded to the fact that it apparently has something to do with the New Republic. When I first saw it, I thought they blew up Coruscant. And I was like, holy crap! And then it was like, oh wait, it wasn't Coruscant. And then instantly, <laughs> it's like, all emotion Yeah, and that scene you do see an ocean, too, so. And so it's like, right. I don't know. It looked cool, but it's like, I don't know. It, it felt like kind of a cop-out where they just wanted to have something that was like, like omnipotently destructive and omnipotently evil when I feel like that's a bit stretching. I could have easily had another type of threat um, and mm-hmm. it would have been a bit more, I don't know, an earned threat. This one just, it just felt kind of floppy and just not very, it didn't feel very compelling. Yeah, I had a lot of problems with it. The first one being that it existed at all. Same <laughs> with what you said. Um, you know, I thought they pulled it off pretty good for the idea but i mean i think about this like let's make a new star wars movie uh hmm what are we gonna do oh i know a giant orb shaped super weapon because that's a unique idea it's like <laughs> i just uh, it's every idea. And, uh, well, it goes and, back. And, and i'm gonna oh, have go a big issue if in episode nine they're building a second one and they have to destroy it before it's completed and they have a big shield around it like again once again they had the shield problem though interesting solution to fly in hyperspace to into the planet's atmosphere Mm-hmm. I don't think yeah. fi- I don't think like I admire the idea, but I literally don't think that the human reaction speed is like finite enough to be able to actually make that. And Hans like now, like no, yeah. you need like four supercomputers running and clocking, overclocking themselves to maybe make that target. That would be yeah. like it's the equivalent that's a stretch of, too. <laughs> it's equivalent of firing a bullet with enough force to orbit the planet, split a hair on your head orbit the planet again and kill hitler in the past (laughs) yeah well that's one of those things that's one of those movie making parts where i I read this term on the internet the other day that made me laugh it's like we're kicking a dead horse until it's a dead dog you know i feel like (laughs) i feel like us star wars fans tend to do that and that's one of those parts where everyone's going to be explaining away exactly how it happened but just the fact is to me i think it's just a movie making thing they tried to do something for the sake of cool and it came out gimmicky but oh well whatever because yeah even with the computer at the fast speeds they're traveling I mean, a fraction, like a thousandth of a second, would have been millions of miles difference. Exactly. Really. I mean, and you know, I guess they're not really going light speed. They're in hyperspace, which is well, that it was kind of a stretch. I mean, cool idea, but yeah, I agree. The execution was a little me. But anyway, my other thing about Starkiller Base, getting back to that. Um, yeah, first of all, okay, I'm going to digress just a little bit more because um, we talked about how it's kind of a remake of the Death Star. And the first thing we talked about tonight was basically how this movie had a lot of the same plot of A New Hope. Um, what not as many people seem to notice is it actually had a lot of elements of the plot from all three of the original movies. So personally, I kind of suspect yeah. that the next movie, Episode Eight, is going to have a huge departure from the original series. I just think this one kind of seems more like a let's play in the sandbox, see what we have to work with and see what we can do. And we'll kind of reference all three of the original movies because it did have elements of all three, not just a new hope. So I kind of think the fifth one will have a big departure. Yeah. Although we have, uh, I'm really interested, going to be interested to see when Ray is actually tempted by the dark side, because I know that's going to happen. And I wonder how they're going to do that. That'll be very fun. If there's going to be a, like, Ray, I am your father moment, though, I'm going to be mad about it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Here's the thing that I thought, and apparently a lot of other people were thinking, too. It may not be a Ray, I am your father, but what if it's Ray, I am your brother? Like, Well, yeah, like, <laughs> I guess um, about that, I kind of thought that, too. Just the marketing, the way they had Ray and Kylo Ren on the poster with their weapons, you know, being parallel to each other. And I, I kind of suspected that they'd be siblings. But then after... Han and Leia didn't seem to recognize Rey at all. I don't think so anymore. My personal yeah. feeling is that 
if she's related to anyone, it's going to be Luke's daughter. That um, would be interesting. <laughs> I think so. Um, yeah. It just there's a lot of evidence in the movie that tends to point that way. Like for instance, Kylo Ren has his fit when they say they didn't get the droid and whatever. He slices up the computer and he's like, "Anything else?" And then the guy says, "Oh, and they were accompanied by a girl." Well, why did and, he react the way he did? He completely yeah, that was, was like way over the top. Yeah, and then he was talking to Snoke about it. He's saying, like, if what you've said is true, bring her to me. Then there's a whole thing where she touches the lightsaber, and then, like, you hear Obi-Wan, both old and young Obi-Wan's voice, and Yoda's voice, and then Maz <laughs> comes down and says, like, it belonged to Vader, and then to Luke, and now to you, and this is your first step, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff pointing to, like, you're related somehow. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, okay, we've hit another one. Sorry, I have to take a detour real quick. What was the name of the character who had the lightsaber? Maz Kanata. Yoda 2.0. Basically, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there's only they're like they're like okay, old, we need to have some wise. old kooky thing that's gonna help them, give them advice, and get them on the right path. Of course, it's got to be a short little alien. Of course, <laughs> yeah. Orange that was the instead Empire of green. Moment. <laughs> carrots instead of cabbage. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. I don't like. Why can't they at least try and get a little bit away from the formula? Like just yeah. a smidge. Yeah, so I agree. Like, I do think they pulled it off pretty well for what they did, but there was an awful lot of that. That's true. You know, I always kind of thought, I had an interesting experience through the movie. There was something, it's like walking out of it as a whole, like I definitely saw those parallels too. And that probably aided a lot into the way my conclusion, but I walked out and one of the first things I thought, is, you know, I was satisfied, but then looking at it as a whole, it it's not, it feels that they've really made a really big opening though, because there are so many things that could could be like we're sitting here thinking about a lot of them now, you know, and just I mm -hmm. I can't help but feel you know like just what could possibly come next, and you know it seems like they're doing a lot of stuff for the fans, which I'm okay with, but they did do a little stuff that went overboard, but I had a lot of there were a lot of nods there that I was I thought were pretty or at least decent or subtle enough to not take you out of the the movie as a whole right. you know little things like but, you see the training remote the chessboard you know they weren't necessary they didn't have right. to be in there the reference to the 12 parsec castle run you know but it was okay yeah it's just i kind of left though and i for some reason i had to i have like a little inner struggle while i was thinking it kind of feels on a grand scale a little rushed but not at the same time because this, this is one of the best movies i've seen in the year you know it's by far one of the best I've like, been directed and actors are fantastic and the storyline is awesome. I'm really looking forward to the next one, but there were some parts it just, as a whole, I just couldn't shake the feeling. I, it's, there are some, some parts I can't nail them down. It's so vague, but it's still there that I've felt it before with some other ones, although those are <laughs> terrible movies. This obviously is not, but it's, I don't know. It feels you, Landon, you're saying it's like important. thousands of voices crying out in terror and then suddenly <laughs> silenced. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> All right, so uh, we've been actually running for a pretty good time. I want to like, maybe limit us down to 15 more minutes. I, I feel like there's still more I want to say. So um, I guess I, I want to say like uh, maybe we can have uh, five minutes to talk about uh, a subject that you feel is like, like the subject you really want to like say in this discussion before we go. Um, but I just need to, we just need to stay on track because I don't want to make this more than two hours. Um, <laughs> but I'll I'll start okay. us off. Um, I want to talk about some of my highlights. I feel like I've been doing a lot of slamming, and I feel like I've gotten all my grudges out. And so <laughs> overall, my impression, I think it was fantastic. Um, unlike one, two, and three, I felt like I was watching like authentic Star Wars again. Um, yeah. JJ Abrams really, I think, going with the uh, practical effects over uh, C, uh, like CGI. I feel like that was a really good step in the right direction. I feel like that the writing is fresh and makes sense as opposed to prequel, just BS that was a spoon forced down our throats, especially when it came to relationships. Um, and I want to focus my, my comments primarily on um, Finn and Ren, Ray. They have the best character arcs in the world. For instance, my favorite thing is their chemistry. Like, Unlike Anakin and Padme, where like they had to have lines like "You're in my soul, tormenting me." Oh gosh. I tortured by the kiss that shouldn't have happened. You know, like like all these things are like they have to like tell you what's going on instead I don't of showing like you. Sand. Exactly. But with these two, we have with Ray and Finn. Like 
you have like the cute moments where they're like where she attacks him because like the droid's like he stole the jacket and so she's immediately just like beating the crap out of him yeah. I mean that's funny <laughs> and it was interesting and then they get attacked so they have to work together they decide last second like that like they're, i like how they're like that that thing's a piece of garbage we gotta go to this ship and then when they they escape i love my favorite moment of the whole movie probably was after they escaped and they both like meet inside like the hallway and they're like oh my gosh and and you did that you did that and she's like and you did that that thing and we're like and we did that together and it was insane <laughs> it was like I feel like I've had that conversation with people before, and it's like the best feeling in the world. Uh-huh. And like immediately, I was just like, I want them to kiss right now. Why am I feeling this emotion? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I loved how Ugh. that um, they also both had like a critical like turning point where um, it was at the same time, which was a little kind of clumped. But I did like how um, when Finn like has a chance to actually escape. He immediately turns around and he's just like, look, I care about you. I think you guys are great and I hope the best for you, but I'm not going to fight. The, I'm not going to fight those guys. They're my friends. They're too powerful. There's no chance. I just want to get away. I don't want to be forced to do things I don't want to do. And I felt like that was like a very human thing. It wasn't like forced conflict. It was like yeah. genuinely, yeah, I wouldn't want to fight that either. I totally get where you're coming from, man. And like mm-hmm. you could tell it was a hard decision, but yeah. he's like, ultimately, I got to do it. And then, um, mm-hmm. and then with Ray, the same thing. She's like, gets her lightsaber. She has a, like a forced vision. And then she's like, oh, you finally found the steps on your destiny. And she's immediately, she drops it. She's like, I don't want that. That is not, that is not what I want in my life. That is something I don't understand. And so she runs. And like, I also got the impression that she wasn't like running like she would never, ever want to be a Jedi type of thing. But like, if I were suddenly woke up the next morning, I tripped had a vision and the next thing i know some weird like orange alien is telling me that my destiny is to become a superhero and to save the world from darth hitler i don't know if i'd be super excited at the first second yeah, I, mean, have a I don't lot know to if i think about i don't know if i'd chuck a lightsaber i mean that's pretty cool but i understood <laughs> where her conflict came from and that's right. the key like star wars has not had since the very original trilogy character conflict and growth that made sense and felt human and we finally have that again. So, clapping. I am super impressed. There is almost, that's the, the most pivotal point and the most important thing for me in this series is the character development. And it makes me so excited for the future. But, uh, all right, so that, that's my soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I'll go next. You know, mine's a bit more... What, like there was one thing it was the, probably the most interesting part but also the least impactful i mean like it doesn't really mean much to the story as a whole but i want to yeah, know what you guys your guys opinion on this too okay. for some reason at the beginning of the movie you know like all the the previews went by and the light dimmed for the final time and you could see like i could see like lucas films you know like all this stuff and i was i was in my chair like oh man here it comes you know the crawling text yes uh and then it's dark and then you know the theme song plays and but the thing is and then after that then when they had the final credits that same song was it's this there's something about it it's it's kind of unfortunate the way what i thought i just felt weird about it for some reason you know i i'm not as diehard a fan as you guys are obviously but i still loved all the movies beforehand you know with a few exceptions <laughs> um but <laughs> right yeah <laughs> but there was Afterwards, I had to think about it for a while. Like there was a conflict in me, where at the beginning, because Star Wars, <clears throat> excuse me, Star Wars at this point is such a iconic thing. Everyone knows about it, even if you've never seen it or hate it. You know, everyone knows what the the theme song is. Everyone knows what it is, and it's a gag in so many, so much media now, and it has been for years. And all this stuff that I've seen. So my brain was telling me when the thing began, uh, when the Text, the crawling text started going at the beginning of the theater or of the movie. I was thinking, this is cliche, but it's not because this is what it's for. <laughs> but my brain's like, but it's still cliche. But I'm like, no, it's not. This is literally what it was made for. But like that feeling was still churning around. I, I, you know, I got rid of it as soon as it started. But it was, it was just like an inner struggle inside of me between light and dark. And I didn't know which side to take. 
<laughs> you know, actually, I had, I had a little bit of a different experience. Because remember how I said earlier how we were, like, in the front rows of the IMAX theater? Mm-hmm. So when the text screen started going on, we immediately were playing a tennis match. Because we couldn't see the whole script. Yeah. So I had to go back <laughs> and forth and back and forth trying to read it. <laughs> it's like eating a corn on the cob as fast as you can. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah so for me um so you know i feel like oh, i have so many thoughts that we just don't have time to do for tonight i feel like we might need to do this again <laughs> with all oh, yeah, definitely. i i i'd be a for it but anyway yeah. let's, let's hear your thoughts so we never really finished the discussion about star killer base because i got us distracted my fault <laughs> um <laughs> but you know that whole scene there one one thing that i just about this movie in general is it definitely felt like a jj abrams movie for good and for worse um, you know, going back to J.J. Abrams, the new Star Trek movies, one of the things that bothered me in all those was his sense of physics and space and space within space, like spacing between celestial objects, gravity, physics, like all that. He just doesn't yeah. seem to care about it at all when it comes to making <laughs> no. a cool shot. No, yeah, it's not. And so, you know, the Starkiller base, when it fires, first of all, it's shooting this ridiculous beam of whatever it is. And then somehow it gets from wherever that planet was all the way to wherever part of the, I mean, it gets to the core system that blows up the Hosnian system and there's five planets in that system and it blows them all up and they're in the core worlds, which is, you know, pretty close to Coruscant, Corellia, that area of the galaxy. Um, but then everybody on the planet at uh, Maz's castle, they see it and that planet's called um, Takodana. I don't really know how to pronounce it yet, but that's the name of it. And that's in the mid rim, basically. Oh my God. Uh, that's, you think about how far away that is, yet they saw it. Okay, and, so, like, so you're saying if that then, energy bolt wasn't traveling in hyperspace, it would have yeah. that, that that those three shots of it firing to it being seen on the planet to obliterating the planet should have taken I don't know a million years. Well, here's the thing though they actually do account for that for the speed of it. Um, they do mention that it's like a sub hyperspace or something or other super weapon, and so it implies like it shoots through hyperspace, which okay I can handle that. Okay. That's fine, but the fact that they could see it from that far away. And then you have yeah. the shot where you see the beams blowing up all five planets at once. Granted, it looked awesome. But think about how far away those planets <laughs> should have been and how it's close true. they were. I mean, they were closer than the Earth and the Moon in that shot. All of them were within yeah. the distance between the Earth and the Moon, basically. I Not only thought, that. Mm -hmm. When I honestly saw that, I thought that planet just had four moons. If that was yeah, all the planets, that is ridiculous. Yeah, there were five planets in that system, um, uh, and and then the palm, beam. Oh, and palm. even if they even if they were moons, they are way too close to the planet. True, and, but if they were moons, it would at least be forgivable. <laughs> right, I and mean, you kind of that's that's one of these movie making theme thematic ideas. I just gotta try to forgive, but that one really stuck out. And then the fact that the big red beam split up into individual rays to hit each planet. You know, I don't deny that they may have had technology to somehow magically do that. <laughs> but Big uh, shotgun. Kapow, kapow. But the fact that it stayed together until it got to that point, I don't know. Yeah. That was a stretch. Um and I just feel like it's one of those style things that JJ Abrams put in because hey look it looks cool, but it makes no sense and he doesn't care. <laughs> um I feel right. like, you know, the Star Trek movies had the same problem. You had a lot of shots in space of things that you look at it and like that makes no sense. It looks cool, yeah. But that's mm -hmm. one of the that was my one of my biggest worries with him doing the movies and Unfortunately, you know, apparently it was a founded worry because Star Wars thus far, granted it's science fiction, it's a space opera, there's a lot of unbelievable stuff, but a lot of it can be explained away fairly easily, and the fans are really good at doing that, like we've talked about, but right. I feel like this movie is going to be a lot harder to do that with, uh, just yeah. because of these shots. Um, yeah. And, you know, the other part about Starkiller Base... Well, first of all, you guys were talking about the Republic, and I read up on that after because I agree it wasn't clear enough. I mean, we knew the Republic got blown up, and they mentioned the Republic fleet was gone because it was at the Hosnian system. But right. it seems like nobody really cared all that much. You know, granted, <laughs> the main characters but wouldn't no have cried. seemed no to care all that much. Like, yeah, oh, right. and you know, blow up. <laughs> well, you know, the main characters like. And Finn and Ray wouldn't have necessarily been as emotionally connected as the rest of the Resistance, you know, and they were the main characters, so that kind of makes sense. You didn't see them all too upset. But I mean, the rest of the resistance should have been going crazy about it because, like, there goes the fleet. We're all that's left, basically. <laughs> We're right. screwed. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and also though, just kind of a note on the Hosnian system. Since you mentioned it, the reason why the Republic was there was because in this new Republic, um, whichever system, like, they vote 
for which system is going to host the government and they kind of switch planets and so it just happened to be at the Hosden system at that time. Ah. Well, that makes a little more sense. So that's just kind of the background on it's working. Mm. Yeah. I still so say my that other if they'd blown, uh, blown up Coruscant, it would have been a lot more impactful. Not, right. saying, yeah. they should. Like, Not saying they should, but <laughs> it would have been yeah, a I lot agree. more like the like Han dying. Like it would have been like what they blew up Coruscant too. Then like, oh my gosh. Right. Well, here's my other complaints about Starkiller Base, though, just to finish that off. Um, you know, they showed the holograms of the Death Star, and they compared it to Starkiller Base. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a lot bigger than the Death Star, sure. But the Death Star, they were showing the first Death Star, and it is um, 120,000 meters in diameter. So 120 kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, which is pretty big, but it's really not that big. Right. It's pretty that's so it's still in a in a galactic scale. It's um, tiny. Yeah, like when they say it's a small moon, they weren't kidding. That would be a tiny moon, um, itty bitty. I mean, huge space station, but itty bitty moon. Bring that to Starkiller Base. Yeah, it was a lot bigger, but even Starkiller Base is way smaller than our moon. It was not all that big, and to yeah. to show it in relation to the star and how big it was, yeah. it's like just another <laughs> one of those scale things. Yeah, it's well, like that was a itty bitty little star. Yeah, and well, it, that's that's one thing that I had a big issue with is. They claim, and I'm willing to buy into the whole, yeah, our new weapon can consume an entire star and focus its energy into a beam. You know, that, I mean, I'm willing to accept that for this movie. But there was one thing, I mean, and I understand the shot, the scale, but do they have to move to a new star every time they need to fire the weapon? Or do they, was that them siphoning off of one for two shots? Or or what, right. what did they just put an incredibly tiny star or something <laughs> and that doesn't make sense either because yeah like the first time they shoot you have general hux out there first of all i love general hux's character because you meet you know the guy the actor and you see him at comic-con doing panels and he's a goofball like he is just a funny little goofball um but then you see him in the movie and you're like that is not at all the actor's personality he did a fabulous job in my opinion but you have him giving a speech to the first order and then they fire the weapon and guess what it's daytime <laughs> when they fire that weapon. It is daytime. Uh -oh. There is definitely sunlight, and they fire it. And so, if that was a mistake, fine. It was a, a simple filming mistake. But if it wasn't a mistake, the only possible explanation does that mean that once the sun was used, their base is useless. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Can the entire planet go through hyperspace? If not, that's such a waste of resources. But then, For apparently, it doesn't need to use up the entire sun to shoot. But then how come when it was charging up the weapon, Finn made a big deal of, it needs to drain the sun. As soon as it's gone, it will fire. Well, I apparently would, not, because tell that to the Hosnian system. I would argue that it could have been a binary star system. Those are fairly common. But it still leaves the glaring error of a super massive weapon that can only fight, be fired twice. Right. You know, now, if it can go through hypers, great. But I, m making a planet go through hyperspace is a bit of a stretch to me. So yeah, that's my biggest cool problem. Like, I think Starkiller Base is a cool concept, but I don't feel like they really thought it all the way through. Anyway, kind of end on a, po on a positive note, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have to give this disclaimer here. Like, I just feel like I'm very nitpicky on, on Star Wars in general, and especially, you know, the new movie, because I have so many expectations for it. But I don't want anyone to think I just hated it, because I loved the movie. I really did. It's just a lot easier to talk about nitpicky yeah. things you know because there's just so exactly. much to take in and i liked more about it than i disliked it's just easier to talk about the dislikes but i just i agree with what you guys have said about the characters like poe dameron his character like not only is he kind of he's clever and he's funny but he reminds me of that annoying kid in class that is good at everything and you just hate him but you absolutely <laughs> love it when he's on your team or in yeah. your group yeah i love you know? that and that's a great description well, and I love it when a character gets that kind of a reaction out of me, like the person you feel like you can really relate to, whether or not, like, I personally don't think I'd be good friends with him if I were to meet him in real life, just personality-wise, but because it's so he's so believable as a personality, and I just love that, and I thought that um, Oscar Isaac did a great, great job with that character. Same with Finn. Um, you know, I thought he did a great job with the character, and like you had mentioned before, how he just wanted to leave and get out, get away from the First Order. Think about if you've been in that situation. You know what the First Order can do. You know how brutal they are. And you know that they're going to be after you for defecting. And if they find you, they'll do nasty things to you. And you don't want to be around for that. And then, you know, you have Rey, who is a very mysterious character. We don't know a whole lot about her past. Um, oh, she's other my than... waifu. She is totally my Star Wars waifu. 
<laughs> but you know, like she's very complex in that we don't know where she learned all the stuff that she can do. She's very good with electronics and technology and all that. But then she's also very gentle and kind. And it's a it's a very big difference from our former um main heroes that we find on the desert planet. You think about, you know, Luke, well, I want to go to Tashi Station to pick up power converters. <laughs> and then we have Anakin, you know, and just don't even right. need to comment on his personality. <laughs> and so it's kind of neat to have this character. <laughs> Yeah, it's just Sorry. neat to have this character who also comes from a sandy, sandy planet beginning, but she is very mature and very strong, very uh, a very mature character already. And it's going to be interesting to see her training process because we're all assuming she's going to be training with Luke, of course. And um, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting. I'm kind of rooting for her having a double bladed oh, lightsaber cool. <laughs> in the next movie because that I mean, she's sweet. She's already set up. Do you use the quarter sign? Or what if she were to convert that staff she has into a lightsaber just with a huge handle? That would be a different weapon, you know? And That'd be interesting. It'd be pretty cool. But, oh, that'd be sweet. And then Kylo Ren, you know, like, Kylo Ren was just a... We already talked about him a lot, so I will not really mention him too much. But just, I loved how we have this villain. Like, you see Darth Vader, and he's already polished. He's like the Sith Lord. You don't mess with Vader. And then we have Kylo Ren, and it seems like the people, his colleagues, are just as afraid of him as the Resistance would be. Um, you know, yeah. granted, the stormtroopers and the Empire weren't exactly fans of Vader either, but it just kind of shows Kylo Ren being in a very immature, like embryonic stage of a of a dark force user. And I don't know if they'll ever really get to like Sith Lord. I don't know if they're going to do that with these movies, but it's just it's neat to see a character that's so complex um, and he's unsure of himself. He's immature. He makes bad decisions, you know. And there's the the little rivalry going on between him and General Hux that I think is going to be a great thing to watch how they kind of mm -hmm. get at each other and try to one up each other, you know, and Kylo Ren is making bad decisions, but you know, Snoke doesn't seem to get too upset at him for it. He's very, and that's, I guess we'll have to talk about Snoke another time. That's another one of a lot of comments. on Definitely. But, yeah. yeah Definitely. I love all these characters basically. And BBA, you know, just love him. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure I'd like him when I first saw him in the trailer. It's like, what is the use in a soccer ball droid? <laughs> <laughs> but after seeing him in action, it's similar to my opinions on the robots in Interstellar the first time I saw it. You know, they're big yeah. walking boxes. How is that? The Marines, really? But then you see them in action. You're like, wow, that, they did a good job. So, mm -hmm. exactly. Landon, do you have any uh, last second thoughts, keeping them brief, but uh, anything you want to go out on? Um, no, not so much that it hasn't already been said. I mean, I really agree. There is, I haven't walked out of a theater. So it was such an interesting feeling. I've never walked out of a theater feeling this way, but it was so overwhelmingly positive though. I mean, it wasn't, I, I won't go so far as say it's the best movie that will ever be, but I mean, it's definitely the best one I've seen this year and probably for the next few, I imagine until the other ones come out and we'll see how those turn out. But it was, it's almost indescribable to me where it was just a mix of happiness, satisfaction, anticipation, and just, you know, and it, 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 it actually, I was thinking about, you know, because we've been, I remember people were going on about this movie when it first was announced. Like, I, I don't even remember how long ago, but they just like, oh, they're making another Star Wars movie. And a lot of people were like, oh, that's going to be dumb. But like, no, but it's being made by Disney, you know, and a lot of people still were skeptical. And then they just, they were coming out with these commercials and merchandise before the movie was even out. You know, I was really kind of worried though. So I avoided a lot of stuff about the movie. Like I only watched one of the trailers that came out or two technically, but you know, I knew everyone was talking about it. Everyone was excited about it. And then, you know, and I was worried that people were just talking, you know, milking this way more than they really needed to, you know, that, that it wouldn't live up to what everyone was expecting. But Honestly, it really held up for me. I, you know, truth be told, I didn't exactly know what to expect, but it definitely, I did was not underwhelmed. It was not something that I expected more from. It was above and beyond what I hoped for. You know, it was, I don't know. It was just one of those really, really good ones. I hope that the next three, uh, the next ones are just as good as this one, which, you know, might be a little much to ask, but still one can hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I want to just close with a with a little story I read earlier today. Actually, um, I'm gonna mispronounce it, but the actor who plays Finn, I think it's a uh, John Boyega, yep. Boyega. Yeah. Um, he was in an interview recently, and it was really funny because he said that um, he was home with his friends, you know, hometown, because he's you know he's still not he's super huge name actor yet, and uh, like they went to the movie together, like he went with to the movie with his friends. And they came out of the theater, and his friends turned to him, and they're like, 
you had a much bigger part than I thought you did. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, I thought you were just going to be some kind of like extra in the background or something. He's like, really? That's awesome. <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm sorry, John, but uh, your past of being able to like just casually watch movies with your friends and uh, be mistaken for just another extra, they're gone. You did such a good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you all so much for sticking with us to the end. This definitely went longer than we thought, and I still feel like there's more to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah, please. we're going to do it again. <laughs> definitely. Look for a part two. Yeah. But in the meantime, if you found this, please leave a like and subscribe if you want more. I'm planning on this being the kickoff of my YouTube channel, The Blue Shifting. Um, you'll be able to find more Let's Plays, uh, Geek Talk, and news stories. I'm very excited to get started in this. I've been kind of preparing for about a year because I don't like doing something part way. So I hope you all pay attention and are willing to, to see more content. Uh, leave a comment if you have any suggestions or if anything we can do to improve. I, I really would love some feedback. Um, and keep an ear out. Uh, um, I'll provide any links to any of the works of my brother who does do lots of art and uh, Steven who uh, might have a post or a, face or, um, a website where he wants to do more discussions on the topic. If they uh, do so, I'll make sure to leave a link in the description. Anyway, thanks again, and uh, stay tuned for part two. Bye. Bye. Bye.